Before I introduce our author for this evening, we have a couple of programs coming up. I'd like to mention in uh, on October 1st, which is a Tuesday night, I believe at 6.30, although I'm not positive we set the time, um, the Saugus Historical Commission is going to do uh, a presentation on Round Hill, which is um, they're working to raise funds and awareness so they can um, restore that historic landmark here in Saugus. So. I know there's a lot of interest in that, and I'm sure we'll have a full house. Um, then, in um, conjunction with lots of people in the community, we, I was approached about putting together a program on um, GMOs, which is genetically modified organisms. You know, it's all the, um, it's a very hot topic in food communities that we have. We're going to be showing three films and having discussions on three different nights in October. Um, here, so the fly. I'm just doing preliminary um, publicity. So if anybody wants, there's some flyers about that. We'll have more information about that later. And we set up a couple other things today. I don't even have all the details. So uh, feel free to check our website, check Facebook, um, give us a call. We'll be happy to fill you in on what's going on. Okay, this evening we are pleased to have Mr. Donald Brown, who was uh, born locally, and, um, and as a young gentleman endured many hardships in his life and ended up joining the Marines at age 17. Things didn't get much better there. He was um, very seriously injured and he left the military um, partially disabled for life. Um, he had brief careers in uh, semi-pro baseball and football, but again his health interfered with that. At the age of 36, he was confined to a wheelchair and had no high school diploma, but he enrolled in a free class at Mount Wachusett Community College. From there, he went on to Amherst College and eventually Harvard Law School. So he has quite a story to tell. And his book, which is his first book, and he has several more slaves to come out soon, um, he describes his journey. And um, I would like to join me in welcoming Mr. Bush. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully we'll talk about his writing process and his journey. Um, I'll talk about anything you want me to talk about. <laughs> if you'd like to buy books, he'll, have, he'll be available to sign them out. Well, you must be wondering, what's this title about? <laughs> the Morphine Dream. What's that about? <laughs> That's why it's the title. <laughs> because it evokes curiosity. And people typically will go in a bookstore and they'll say, hmm, I wonder what this is about. And then they read it and then they buy it. <laughs> but anyway, it's also going to come out as a movie soon. And, uh, but I want to start out by going back before the dream. The dream was an actual event in my life. But before that, I was born into a, the family of an Irish dirt farmer. And we had nothing, zero. <laughs> but I didn't know it. <laughs> I didn't know we were poor. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't like we didn't have much money. We didn't have any money. <laughs> My father would trade cucumbers for prescriptions or whatever, and a chicken for, to pay the doctor's bill. And uh, we grew up like that. And my father and his father before him and his father before him were all Irish dirt farmers. They had nothing. They came over on the Mayflower. They should have had enough time to figure out how to do something. <laughs> but they never figured anything out. All they did was work and sleep. <laughs> and every now and then they'd make babies. <laughs> it was a whole bunch of us. And uh, when I was 12, he, he was manic depressive, and that was in the days before there was any knowledge of what that was. And there was no psychiatrist, and there was no magic medicine. And so he was always kind of in a problem time, especially in the winter. And uh, when I was 12, he killed himself. So that left us in worse shape. <laughs> if, if you can imagine being worse than having nothing <laughs> and having a father who was manic depressive and in the hospital half the time. And, and my poor mother, I don't know how she ever did it. <laughs> Seven children and she stood by him. And But anyway, when he died, it was real chaos. And I was in the summer between 6th and 7th grade. And I had to start to work all the time to earn money to help my mother. So I used to deliver papers. I'd get up at 3 in the morning and walk to the news agency and, and tie the papers for all the stores and all the paper boys, including my own route. And then they'd drive me out to the end of my route and drop the papers off at every street along the way, and I'd go deliver papers 
for four hours till I got to school. <laughs> Every morning, that was the way I lived. And uh, I remember on Thursdays, they used to have a coupon in the newspaper for a free loaf of bread. <laughs> I would cut out the coupon out of 200 newspapers. <laughs> and my customers would say, hey, what happened to my paper? And I'd say, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, they got used to it after a while. <laughs> and I'd go to the grocery store and get 50 loaves at a time and take them home. And in the morning, my mother would break up the bread with a little milk and sugar, and we'd have breakfast, bread and milk. <laughs> and then for lunch, we'd have sandwiches, all you want, with mayonnaise. But take it easy on the mayonnaise, please, because we had to buy that. <laughs> but you could have as much bread as you wanted. <laughs> and then for dinner, we had something made with bread and bread pudding for dessert. And I grew up knowing for sure what our daily bread meant. <laughs> That's all we ate. <laughs> and I used to work in the dry cleaners and the hardware store, and I'd play baseball. That's all I did, work and play baseball. <laughs> I was like my father, work and sleep. I was work and play baseball. <laughs> and I had a job in the cleaners. <laughs> And that was a great job. Can you imagine working in the cleaners and saying it was a great job? <laughs> I had the job of going through the pockets of all the laundry that was brought into the place. And I used to find some really surprising things in the laundry. And, and I was allowed to keep all the money <laughs> in the incidental things. I couldn't keep anything valuable. <laughs> And I used to see lots of things that didn't belong in pockets, <laughs> like ladies' undergarments and men's suits. <laughs> and it was really a joy to work in the cleaners because every day was like a discovery trip, you know. And uh, so I did that, and I didn't get paid for that. I was only allowed to keep the coins. And sometimes the coins would be $30 in one day, <laughs> a $20 bill along with a bunch of coins. <laughs> And a $20 bill back then, I mean, that was like you hit the lottery. <laughs> and I'd go home with the $20 bill, and my mother's eyes would open wide, and she'd say, how did you get that? <laughs> Fish in pockets. <laughs> but anyway, I went on like that for quite a while, playing baseball, going to school, never doing a thing, never did anything in school. And they gave me all Fs, which I deserved. <laughs> and uh, when I got to be 17, and I was still in junior high school, the uh, guidance counselor said to me one day, listen, you're going to be old enough to vote, and you're still going to be here. <laughs> so you should think about getting out of here. You know, go, go in the Marine Corps, and go in the service, get that over with, so when you start to play baseball, you'll be all set. So I thought that was a pretty good thing to do. And uh, so I quit school and joined the Marine Corps. Had a bad accident in the Marine Corps and came out with some pro problems. But I resumed playing baseball, and I was a pretty good baseball player. And it was not too long after I got out that I signed a big, big, big contract with the Los Angeles Angels. And, uh, you know, that was back in the days when, you know, the money that you signed for was something that sounded like it was in the world. You know, it's not like today where they get $40 million a year. <laughs> I got a big bonus, and when I got to California, they said, you can go in and see the owner. He's going to give you your bonus. And you all know who I got that check from. His name was Gene Autry. He was the uh, singing cowboy. <laughs> and he gave me the biggest check I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and I looked at the check, and I looked at him, and I thought to myself, what is he, soft? <laughs> I'd do this for nothing. <laughs> and he's given me all this money. <laughs> It was crazy. So I played baseball for a few years and did well for a couple. And then I started to have diabetic retinopathy in my eyes. I was born with diabetes. So, you know, those things happen to you when you have diabetes. And I couldn't hit a fastball anymore. And when you're a baseball player and you can't hit a fastball anymore, it's <laughs> adios. <laughs> so I came back to Boston and I didn't know what to do because I'd never had a job. <laughs> Playing baseball wasn't a job. That was fun. Pay me to play a game? <laughs> it was crazy. So I didn't know what to do because I had never had to look for a job, and I never had a job really ever since I was very small. So I decided I would try out for the New England Patriots. And I was not a football player, but I was a big guy, and I was an athlete. So I did that. And I made it to tomorrow. Tomorrow's the day when they cut everybody. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> that's when I made it to the last day when they made the final cut. <laughs> and they put me on a practice squad because they like to keep a bunch of players around playing every day so that if they need you, they can call you up. And uh, there's a league just below the National Football League. There's one in every major part of the country, actually, a league like that where the professional teams keep their players playing. So if they happen to run out of defensive tackles, they just reach down to the lower level league that people are playing in and call you up. But I never got called up. And I played there for 12 years. And they pay you for all, you know, they pay you really well just to keep you playing. And then I got to, I had to face this thing, I was too old. <laughs> I was too old. Can you imagine? I was 36 years old and I was too old. <laughs> too old to play football for sure. <laughs> so I said to my family, well, let's go out and have a farm. <laughs> Just like my father. <laughs> I moved out to Western Massachusetts and I bought a little farm. And it was a nice place and I was going to live off the land. <laughs> You know, cut my own wood and grow my own vegetables, and my ex-wife would make the clothes and <laughs> can the vegetables, and we did, we did, and we did really well. Except that the money goes fast when you don't have a salary coming in. So I started to get low on money, and I was worried about it. So I figured I better get a job. But what am I going to do? I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> so I started going to companies that were looking for help, and I said, I'm looking for a job. And they said, what can you do? I said, well, I'm a pretty good football player. That's good. What can you do? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I didn't, know, I didn't even know how to do math. I didn't know anything because I never really went to school after the sixth grade. And I was kind of at a loss. You know, how do you earn a living when you don't know how to do anything and you've never had a job? But finally, I got a job in a really dirty factory. Really, really bad, bad place. <laughs> and my job was to spray paint on a big cast iron equipment that was 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide, and weighed 10 tons. <laughs> and I'd spray the paint on the thing all night long. And the can said, if you come in contact with this paint, go to the nearest hospital. And I would go home spitting it up, blowing my nose full of black paint, covered with black paint. My shower stall would be all black paint. <laughs> After I took the shower, I'd spend more time cleaning the shower than I did cleaning me. <clears throat> and that was my job. And I didn't like it. I'm not going to tell you I did, <laughs> but I did it because it was supporting my family. And that's what you have to do. So I did it a couple of years. And one night there was a guy who used to drive the fork truck around the factory and he would go out and drink lunch instead of eat lunch like a normal human being. <laughs> and he'd come back three sheets to the wind <laughs> and he'd drive around the factory and try and scare us because he was in a different frame of mind. And so this one night I'm reaching over to paint this big sluice gate and I hear a noise and I look back and here he is coming right at me. And I was mortified because I knew he was going to hit me. So I leaped to be back in your lap <laughs> that far. <laughs> my feet stayed there <laughs> and I went there. So my legs were destroyed completely. All my muscles and tendons and ligaments were shredded and no one had ever seen an injury like that. And I could not do anything. I couldn't walk. I couldn't move for a long, long time. Many, many months in the hospital. A lot of surgery. The last big surgery I had was a failure. <laughs> and because it was such a bad surgery, they decided they would give me morphine while I was still asleep. And uh, I didn't want morphine. I didn't want any drugs. So that was against my wishes. And when I woke up, I was on morphine. And I didn't know it. <laughs> and a nurse said to me, would you like a shot? I didn't even know what she was talking about. And I said, sure. <laughs> Got another one. <laughs> Then they sent me back to my room, and the nurse in the room said, you probably didn't get a shot, did you? Another <laughs> one. Then the shift change. <laughs> there were two new nurses. In about 10 minutes, I had two more shots. <laughs> so now I had five shots of morphine. That was enough to kill you. I've never had any since. But that night, instead of just disappearing <laughs> on morphine, I started to listen to a guy named Tony Robbins, who's a very profound motivational speaker. And he said, pull out a pad, write where you want to be in five years. And I wrote Harvard Law School. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I never thought those three words in my life, never said them, never thought about Harvard or Harvard Law School, anything like that. So 
What was it? I don't know. <laughs> and then he said, write a list. What do you have to do to get there? So I wrote number one, get a GED. Well, that was pretty good because I didn't know what a GED was, but I wrote that. Number two, go to community college. Didn't know what that was either. I knew there was college, but I didn't know the difference between any of them. And uh, number three was the letters K-A. I knew what that meant. Kick ass. <laughs> Work hard. <laughs> so off I went with this idea that I'm going to Harvard Law School and I'm going to walk across the country. That was my second dream. He said, turn the page and write where you want to be in 10 years. And I wrote, walk across the country, walking USA. And I drew a map and I put dots everywhere I wanted to go. And I don't know what, what that was all about because that's where I eventually went. <laughs> and I didn't know what it was about, what the dots were about, but it was what I was doing was walking through my life. That was my plan, walk through my life. So I went to sleep with all this on my mind and I dreamt all night long about Harvard Law School and going across the country. And kind of stupid and strange for somebody who never went to school and who was never going to walk again. But that's what I fell asleep thinking. And when I woke up in the morning I was like, oh my God. <laughs> What a nightmare. In fact, in the book, the chapter is called The Nightmares. And then when I woke up, I was thinking about it and thinking, and I said, what the hell, I'll do it. And then the doctor came in, and he said, how are you doing today, big guy? Because he expected me to be down and out, because I had a terrible failed surgery. I said, I'm fine. I'm going to Harvard Law School, and I'm walking across the country. <laughs> He said to the nurse, I don't know what the hell you're giving him, but <laughs> no more. <laughs> he thinks he's going to Harvard Law School. I mean, he's delirious. Stop. Don't give him anything else. <laughs> so then a little while later after he left, I figured I'd got to talk to somebody about this. So I called my mom, who was in her late 70s then. And I said, Ma, guess what I'm going to do? She said, what? I said, I'm going to walk across the country, and I'm going to go to Harvard Law School. She hung up. <laughs> she just hung up. <laughs> My mother <laughs> never did that to me before or since, but she hung up that day. So a few days later, I go home, and I'm relegated to sitting in a recliner all day because I couldn't go anywhere and I couldn't move and I had cast from my waist to my feet with rods tying it all together so I couldn't move a millimeter and I'd sit there in the recliner and watch soap operas. <laughs> that was back in the day when we had three stations, remember? <laughs> and there was something on every one and you had to make a decision which one you were going to watch. Now we got 565 and there's nothing on any of them. <laughs> But So I'm sitting there in the recliner, and I never get into the wheelchair except at the end of the day. And one day, the phone starts ringing, 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 ringing. I mean, it was ringing for a half an hour. <laughs> but I wasn't going to answer it. I didn't answer the phone anymore. It was too hard to get out of the chair. So, you know, there came a time after 100 rings or so, when it was ringing so much, I figured I'd, I'd better go out and answer it just to shut it up. <laughs> So I got out of my recliner and I rolled out to the kitchen in my wheelchair. That was back when we had a phone in the kitchen. Remember that? <laughs> now we got 72 phones and we don't know where any of them are. <laughs> All you hear is, dial my cell phone so I can find that sucker. <laughs> you know? Anyway, it's a chapter in the book, Fate, the Phone Rang. <laughs> and when you think with the phone ringing doesn't mean anything, this changed my entire life. The phone was ringing. And I often think, what if I didn't answer it? Because I did answer it, and my life changed forever. And all the woman said, would you like a free course at Mount Wachusett Community College? And I said, no, thank you. I never went to high school. And I hung up. And I had a neighbor who was a college professor at DePaul University in Chicago. And he summered in Orange, Massachusetts, where I lived. Now, there's a conundrum for you. Who would ever come from Chicago to Orange, Massachusetts? I mean, that's like going to Philadelphia or, or Hoboken for the summer, right? So 
he came in and he said, how are you doing today? And I said, I'm good. You know, I just got a call from a community college. They offered me a free course. He said, well, hell, you should do it. I said, John, please remember, I never went to high school. He said, I know, but they'll help you get a GED. I said, what's that? Because <laughs> I had written that down. I didn't know what it was. He said, it's a high school diploma. It's a general equivalency diploma. I said, oh, really? And I said, what's a community college? <laughs> I had written that down. And he said, well, that's a place for people like you. It's, a, it's the, uh, the first place as a, a person who needs to get an education who hasn't got one should go because it'll be the foundation of whatever you do with your education. It's considered the lowest entry point of the college system in our country. And if you can breathe, you can go to a community college. You don't have to apply. You don't have to do anything. You just walk in the door and they sign you up. <laughs> I thought that all sounded pretty interesting, but he was pushing me to go, and I said, no, get out of here. So he left. <laughs> Came back that night because he wanted to take me for an ice cream, supposedly. And uh, we get in, I get in his car because it's the only car I can get in. It's a big, big old boat. <laughs> I could slide across the back seat, and my feet would hang out the window on the other side. As long as it wasn't raining, we could travel. <laughs> And so we're traveling on the highway, except we're going the wrong way. And I said, John, what are you doing? He said, don't worry about it. A little while later, we pull up in front of Mount Wachusett Community College. And I said, what are you trying to do? I mean, I didn't come out for this. I came for an ice cream. He said, well, if you want one, you're going in. Well, I wanted an ice cream. So I went in. And I get in there, and I started talking to professors and reading about courses and curriculum I was fascinated. I was truly fascinated. Maybe the most fascinated I ever was in any one day in my life at that point. So I walked up to the counter and I said to the woman, I'd like to enroll for three courses. And she said, how will you be paying for this? And I said, nice try, idiot. <laughs> I don't have any money, I said. <laughs> she said, well, let me see what I can do to help you. So she came back a few minutes later and she said, would you mind enrolling as Donna Brown? And I said, why would I do that? <laughs> and she said, well, we have money for women returning to school, but we don't have any for men. And if you would enroll as Donna, I'll get you a semester. And after that, you're on your own. And there's the chapter, Donna goes to college. <laughs> That's how I went to college. And remember, the phone rang, and that started this whole process. You know, just the phone ringing. Serendipity over and over again in my life. They start me as a woman, which was kind of strange when I walked in the bookstore and I said, Donna Brown, and they said, what? <laughs> and I didn't have to have a sex change operation and the state would have paid for it. <laughs> and I didn't have to wear women's clothes. All I had to do was enroll as Donna, and I did. <laughs> And I, it was pretty special. So the next day I go there to orientation. President's down front, 2,000 people. And he says, look to your right, look to your left. Two out of three will be gone at the end of this semester. And I said, what a tragedy. <laughs> Two out of three are going to be out of here? They paid all the money and they're going to be out of here? But that's the way it is. And he said, but if you're one of those ones who's going to be here, and you want to do something with your education, we do a lot of things to support you. We have an award for the best students in each division of this college, 17 awards. If you win that award, that will help you get into a four-year school. And I turned to John, the professor, and said, John, I'm going to win that award. He said, I bet you are. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there thinking, Fitchburg State. <laughs> That's the next step up, Fitchburg State. So I got a goal right away. I'm not even in college yet, and I got a goal, Fitchburg State and an award as the best student in my division. And then the president went on to say, and we have a lot of other things going on here. We have six scholarships that total $12,000. We have 20 awards for certain things like the best in economics and the best in English and on and on. And then we have the award for the best student in the college. And that is a big, big award because you get 20 grand a year as long as you are in college, you know, beyond community college, which means as long as you're like in medical school or law school or whatever. So that's a big one. <laughs> that was special. But I wasn't even thinking about that stuff. 
I was just thinking about I'm going to win the award as the best student in my division, and I'm going to Fitchburg State. And hopefully I'll figure out how to parlay that into Harvard Law School, my other dream. So now the next day is the beginning of class. And my first class is English, <laughs> writing. <laughs> well, this ought to be fun because I never wrote anything. <laughs> the only thing I ever wrote in my life was I signed my name to contracts and checks. That's it, <laughs> nothing else. I never wrote anything. I never wrote an envelope, never mind a letter. So this was going to be really something. <laughs> and I get into the class and the professor's up front. He says, OK, tonight's really easy. <clears throat> Write a one-page thing about your favorite place in the world. I'll be sitting out there in a the car. When you're done, bring it out if, you like, if I like it, you go home. You get out early. Tonight, never the rest of the semester, just tonight. <laughs> so enjoy it. <laughs> so I'm sitting there wondering, what the hell do I do? <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know how to write. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know anything about writing. And so the kids start going out and leaving. <laughs> Down to about two people in there, and it just me and two people. And I figure I better go say something to this guy. So I go out and I say, Professor, you know, I never been in school since I was in sixth grade. He said, how'd you pull that off? <laughs> I said, well, I went to school from seventh, eighth grade, but I never did anything, and I got all Fs because I had other things to do in my life. And he said, well, that doesn't stop you from writing. I said, I don't know how to write. I don't know anything about writing. I don't know anything about English. I don't know what a noun is or a verb. I don't know any of that stuff. He said, but that's all right. You know how to talk, don't you? I said, yes. He said, well, if you can talk, you can write. I never forgot that. I've said those words 200,000 times since then as a college teacher teaching writing. <laughs> Me teaching writing? <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> and, uh, and think about it. If you can talk, you can write. It's as simple as that. If you think you can't write, <laughs> Please don't tell me that. If you can talk, you can write. Just write what you would say. That's all you have to do. And there you got something. <laughs> so I never forgot that, but I still didn't understand him. <laughs> and I said to him, look, you know, you, you're reading this wrong. I'm telling you, I don't know how to do any of this. He said, yes, you do. What's your favorite place in the world? I said, Fenway Park. He said, well, tell me about Fenway Park. I said, well, you know, you walk up the tunnel and then you get to the top and all of a sudden you're seeing this beautiful field with green fences that are all different colors and different shapes and this giant scoreboard that you could see from Russia, <laughs> at least if you're Sarah Palin. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and the white uniforms with the red and blue letters and the red dirt of the infield. It's a cacophony of color you wouldn't believe. It'll blow your mind. And then the organ music starts. And it's, take me out to the, you know. And I, so I wrote, he said, go back and write all that. So I went back and I wrote it. And I took it out and I handed it to him. And he looked at it and he looked and he said, oh my God, where'd you learn to write like this? And I'm looking for his grass. You know, what are you talking about? Write. I don't know how to write. He said, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> this is really good. Well, that was pretty astonishing. Here I was in my late 30s, and I'm in school for the first time since I was 12, and he's telling me I can do something. Well, I never knew that. I really never knew that. I thought I couldn't do anything. I was brought up in a, in a mindset of the boys went to work. The women went to college, but the boys worked. There was nothing ever said about go to college. I mean, that wasn't part of life. We weren't meant to go to college. And, uh, and all my sisters were. And they didn't just go off to college. They had to be teachers or nurses. That was the order. And that's what they did. They all did that. They all became teachers and nurses because that's what my father told them they had to do. They didn't have any choice. And anyway, so... Here I am getting this education, and it goes on like that every day. Wonderful, supportive, uh, really interesting, and not really challenging, not so hard, just interesting. An interesting way to spend your time, especially when you're disabled and you can't do anything else. So I became a really good student and did really well, got all A's. I get to the end of my third semester, and I get a note in my box to go see the transfer counselor. That's the person that facilitates your moving on to a four-year school. So I get into her office. I had no idea what she was writing to me for. And I got there, and she said, Donald, you've been invited to apply to Amherst College. I said, what's that? 
She said, oh, it's the best college in the country. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, you know, Michigan State and <laughs> Ohio State and Stanford and all those others would take offense to that. And she said, well, it is, really is the best college in the country. It's voted that way by 1,200 college presidents every year. And it's a great place. <laughs> I said, OK, so what am I going there for? What do they want with me? <laughs> she said, I don't know, but they want you to apply. And I said, well, if I got in, what would I do? How would I pay for it? And she said, you don't have to worry about that. They'll pay you. Now I'm looking for her grass. You know, <laughs> Who's going to pay me to go to college? She said, they will pay you. I said, what are you talking about? She said, that's the way they are. They need blind. Whatever you need, they give it to you. I said, well, <laughs> this i got to see to believe. <laughs> she said, tomorrow we'd like you to go down there at 4 o'clock. You have an appointment to be interviewed. And it's important to us that you go because it looks good for the school if you go there. And, and these fancy schools are looking for our students. So I said, of course I'll go. <laughs> and I went down the next day and I was supposed to get there at 4 and I got there at 12. Why would I get there at 12? Nervous. Huh? You were nervous. No, what do you do at 12? <laughs> That's why I wanted to get there at 12, because a year, a two years at Community College of Institutional Food, I didn't call it Institutional Food. <laughs> she told me I can't swear, otherwise I'd tell you what it was. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to see the food. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's just the way I thought. <laughs> so I got there, and I walk into the dining hall, and I, ooh, I discover there are six huge dining rooms, about four or five times the size of this one, each room. And uh, each room has a different menu, six different menus, vegetarian over there, uh, international over there, meat and potatoes over here, cheeseburgers and french fries over here, and so forth. It was unbelievable. And then... The food was awesome. And then outside each dining hall is an area about this size. It's called the scoop. <laughs> In the scoop, it's like friendly ice cream. Only you're the server. <laughs> you serve yourself. <laughs> Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you can go in the scoop and have anything you want. <laughs> And we used to do it, too. <laughs> we'd go on three in the morning, we'd have this giant bowl and put everything in it. <laughs> everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> Which, if you remember Roland's ice cream over here in, uh, in the hat, they used to have that menu item, everything but the kitchen sink. That meant you had to put everything in there, every flavor, every everything. And we used to do it, too. And around the country, the... Uh, Students who are in their freshman year of college always gain 10 pounds, and it's known as the freshman 10, universally. But at Amherst, it was the freshman 50, <laughs> because a lot of kids gain 50 pounds. And the funny thing is, when you come back after your first year, you never do it again. You never go eat the ice cream again, because I guess you're so sick of it, <laughs> and so sick of having to buy different sized clothes. <laughs> clothes. <laughs> so that was my first impression of Amherst College, the food and the ice cream. Then I go out walking around the campus. I'm coming from a place where there are 8,000 students in one building. <laughs> and I'm at a place where there's 700 acres, 150 buildings, big, big buildings, much bigger than this one. <laughs> and there's only 1,500 students. And there's 150 buildings. And you ask yourself, what for? That's a building for every 10 students. But that's the way it is. Money, money, money. Amherst has more money than everybody except Harvard. Now, Harvard has more money than God. So, <laughs> Amherst, Harvard has 100 billion. Amherst has only five. That's what they say. We only have five. Only five billion. How'd you like to have only five billion, Paul? <laughs> only five, they say. <laughs> So, you know, I'm walking around thinking, oh, my God, this place is something else. I think it would be pretty nice to come here. You know, I'd love to come here. And then I walk over to the hill that overlooks all the athletic facilities, and there are four baseball diamonds. One of them is under a roof. <laughs> then there is three football fields. One of them is under a roof, a different roof. <laughs> and there's 150 tennis courts. They go as far as the eye can see. You can't even see the last one. For 150 people, what is this all about? <laughs> it's the way it is. So by the time I got through looking around, I, I said, what the hell, I am coming here. No question about it, I'm coming here. <laughs> Whatever I have to do, I'm coming here. So then I go to have my admissions interview and I spend an hour with this lovely lady and then at the end she says where else have you applied and I said nowhere I'm coming here 
She said, well, that's not very smart. <laughs> we only take four or 500 students out of 28,000. <laughs> so you don't have much chance of getting in here. I said, well, I'm coming here. I don't care what I have to do. I'm coming here. If it's not this year, it'll be next year. And she said, well, I, I like hearing your confidence, but that's not smart. <laughs> I said, well, I'm doing it. I'm coming here. <laughs> She said, well, I hope you do well at community college finishing up, and I hope you win an award or two over there, because if you don't, it won't work. <laughs> you won't get in here. Well, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm going to win that award, I promised myself, so, and I'm certainly going to finish up well, so I'm not worried about that part. <laughs> and I go back to my community college. I have a semester left to do, and I have to get all A's. I did that. Near the end of the semester, they give out the, tw the 17 awards for the best students in each division because the students need the knowledge of that award to finish their application process. So they give you those awards early, but that's all they announce early. And when those 17 awards are announced, it's posted on the wall. And of course, I know I'm going to win it, so I'm not worried about that. And I walk over to the list with a big smile on my face, and I look, and I look, and I look. <laughs> not there. <laughs> And oh, was I devastated. How am I going to go to college now? I didn't win. <laughs> and the guy that won only had a 3.2, and I had a 4.0. And he was a good friend of mine. <laughs> and I went in the cafeteria, and he's sitting there with a red face. And I said, Tony, did you see the thing? He said, yeah. <laughs> he, said, he said, I don't believe it. He said, I'm not taking the award. I'm not going to even accept it, because everybody knows you should have got it. He said, I don't know what's going on here, but you should have got it, of course. And we all know that. So I was now mad. So I went up to the department where it was awarded, the history department. The person who made that choice was my professor, my advisor, my friend, and my mentor. And I said to him, Tom, what the hell is going on? You've guided me for two years. You told me everything I had to do. I did it all, and now you go and give this award to some kid who doesn't even want it. What the hell are you trying to do to me? He said, Donald, you won every single award in this college, and we weren't giving you that one. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know all the other awards? You won them all, every single one of them, and all the scholarships and the 20000 a year best student in the college. And I'm like... And I don't tell you this because, you know, I did this. I tell you because I was reaching for the moon. I was reaching for Fitchburg State and an award. And I got the whole damn universe. And that's what happens when you work hard and reach high, you'll get it all. So I try to tell young people today, especially people in college or high school or people who haven't gotten their life jump-started, reach for the damn universe. Don't bother with the moon <laughs> because the universe is out there. I know I got it, and I wasn't even trying to get it. But that's what's out there for people who work hard. Incredible uh, uh, achievements are there for you if you will just simply focus and work hard and have a, a goal that's much farther beyond anything you could ever dream, like Harvard Law School. <laughs> so anyway, I get all those awards. I go to the Academic Awards Banquet a few days later, the same president who says, look to your right, look to your left, he's in there and he says, welcome to the annual Mount Wachusett Community College Academic Awards Banquet. And tonight, for reasons you'll soon find out, we've changed it. It's the Donald Brown night. <laughs> and I got every single award in the college. And it was such an incredible feeling to get that recognition for working hard and doing well. And believe me, I'm not a genius. <laughs> Somebody used to say, well, he must be a genius. No, no. <laughs> I worked hard. <laughs> I sweat. <laughs> That's what it was about. I worked hard. And uh, a few days later, I got a letter from Amherst College. And if you saw Rudy, <laughs> you remember Rudy? Rudy sits at the bench and he opens the letter and he says congratulations and he starts to cry and he gets up and runs. <laughs> That's what happened to me too. I opened the letter, it said the same thing, congratulations, I never read beyond. It's on my wall in my living room, I have never read it. I just read the first word, congratulations. And now I'm in Amherst College, wow. <laughs> so I go down there a few days later to deal with financial aid. And they say, well, you know, we're pretty much done with all this process, so we'll just let you know what's going on. We've paid your room and board and tuition for the next three years. That's $228,000. And we've determined that your need is 75000 a year, and we have paid 
use 75,000 a year in a special account, you'll be able to draw it out 37.5 each semester for the next six semesters. So that's your award. And I'm like in shock. <laughs> And I'm looking for her grass for sure, you know. And the big problem with all this is I gotta wait till September to find out if it's real. And I said, You can't be telling me the truth. She said, No, what's wrong? I said, You're gonna give me all that money and I don't have to pay anything? She said, No. <laughs> and I reached in my pocket and I took out my thirty two thousand in scholarships and I said, By the way, here's my scholarships and she said, Oh well you can keep that. <laughs> You can keep it? <laughs> and I thought that was all to go to the next college, and she told me I could keep it. That was like 500000 today. And she said, you can keep it. <laughs> and then I get there on September 1st, and my check is in the mail. <laughs> it's, in, it's there in my box, the check for thirty seven five for the first semester. And I'm just blown away. I mean, I can't believe it. And then it's not too long after that I figure out the difference between being at a place like Amherst College and a community college. Because at a community college, when you get your syllabus, it's one page. <laughs> and it says, buy a book. <laughs> at Amherst College, when you get a syllabus, it's usually about 35 or 40 pages. And it says, buy 25 books. <laughs> because that's all they're allowed to get you to buy. They, they'd probably have you buy 50 if they were allowed to. But it's limited to 25. <laughs> so I go over to the bookstore and I buy all my books. I got 102 books, <laughs> and I'm in a wheelchair. I can't even carry them. I have to get the building and grounds people to come take me back to my room. And I dump them all out on the bed, and I got a pile <laughs> like a Blue Hill <laughs> of books. <laughs> and I look at it, and I say, oh, my God, <laughs> what am I going to do with all these? And I found out the next day, read three a day, every day. <laughs> every single day, read three books and write a paper. <laughs> Oh, is this something else? <laughs> no one in the world reads that much every day. And when you in Amherst and you see a student walking around, they are always like this. <laughs> and when you see them in a line, they are always like this. <laughs> because you have to read so much, you better read 24 hours a day. And that's really what happens. And then writing a paper every single day? What for? <laughs> so that later in your career, when you have to write, you just do it. <laughs> it becomes very easy. So that was my introduction to Amherst, and the rest of Amherst was like community college only, a much higher level education. And uh, make no mistake about it, though, I went to Amherst College and Harvard Law School, the best college and best university in the world, supposedly. The community college was the best school I ever went to. And the best professors I ever had were the ones at the community college because they gave me life. They gave me an academic life. They built the foundation that allowed me to do all the rest. And I had a lot of big name professors at Harvard and at uh, Amherst, in fact, if you pick up the book, you'll see Alan Dershowitz wrote the cover blurb. <laughs> Charles Ogletree wrote the blurb on the back. You know, Harvard Law School professors and famous people. And uh, yet the people I had in community college were the best professors I ever had. And um, so I finish up at Amherst. What a wonderful, glorious thing to have that happen in the life of an Irish dirt farmer's son to go to Amherst College with the brightest and most phenomenal students in the whole world all there together, the sons and daughters of the richest and most powerful people in the world whose children have gone to the greatest schools in the world and they come to Amherst together and I'm there with them. <laughs> we call them Malibu preppies <laughs> because they arrived at campus with their Lamborghinis or their limousine and a butler and all that kind of stuff and uh, they were different. I, could, I gotta tell you they were different but bright Beyond bright, absolutely beyond bright. In fact, my advisor at Amherst was a professor. The, he started there the same semester I started there. And at the end of the first semester, I said to him, so what's it been like for you, Frank? He was much younger than me. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's very scary here, very scary. <laughs> now, this is a guy who had a PhD in history and had 10 years teaching experience before he came to Amherst at uh, places like Clark and BU. <laughs> And I said, why is it scary? He said, listen, <laughs> I'm 40 years old and I come here and these 18-year-old kids know more than I do about my specialty. 
That's true. They do. They're so bright. And to be in school with them was a privilege, a wonderful thing to be in school with all these young people who, in spite of <laughs> our kidding, Malibu preppies, I mean, they were special kids. And somebody once said to me, so how'd you like those girls at Amherst? <laughs> I said, pretty good, I married one. <laughs> <laughs> I married one of the Malibu preppies. <laughs> Anyway, so then it's uh, time to go off to law school, and I go to Harvard Law School because Harvard beat Yale by $1,000 in the financial aid bidding war, <laughs> which goes on when you're an Amherst student. You can go anywhere you want to go, and they all bid for you. You know, they, It's just like signing to play baseball. <laughs> Everybody wants to pay you more. <laughs> so you go to Yale, and you say, look, Harvard just offered me 17. They say, well, we'll give you 18. <laughs> so you go to Harvard, and you say, Yale just offered me 18, and we'll give you 20. <laughs> And that's how it goes. <laughs> and as soon as you get the package you want, you go. And I went to Harvard. And the first day I was there, I was asked by my new advisor to go to a meeting for Harvard Law students that, that uh, recruit minorities at community colleges in the in inner city. And I had done some of that at Amherst, so I was happy to do that. And so I went to the meeting. and. There was a few people there, but there was only one that I really got to talk to. She was a tall black girl. She's very pretty, very well dressed, very well spoken. And she was recruiting for Princeton, where she went to school. And I was recruiting for Amherst, of course. So we went off to Princeton a couple of days, uh, to uh, community college a couple of days later, and I won. <laughs> there was one really good candidate there, and I got him. He went to Amherst. And she was kind of ticked off that, you know, I got this advantage. Everybody wants to go to Amherst. They'd rather go to Amherst than Princeton if they had that choice. So anyway, we did that quite a bit together. And uh, she was a very special person. She made my first couple of years at Harvard very special. And you all know her, by the way. You know, she's somebody you know, too. Can you imagine that? You know my, my classmate. Her name's Michelle Obama <laughs> now. It was Robinson then. <laughs> And then in my third year, after she graduated, I get back to school in late August, and, and the, the people coming in, the first year students coming in, they all want to play basketball, the men, because they, they have all this nervous energy building up about law school so difficult. It's not really, but they think it is. And they have this nervous energy, so they go to play basketball at the gymnasium on the Harvard Law School campus. And most of them were basketball players in their time in college. They played on heavy-duty college basketball teams. And then they get to Harvard Law School, and there is no team. So you got to go to the gymnasium and play pickup pick up basketball. Well, that pickup basketball is as dangerous as playing in the NBA Finals. I mean, it is cutthroat killer basketball. <laughs> and I'm out there in the court, and I'm not into that kind of basketball. I'm just to give me the ball, and I'll lay it up, you know. I hang around under the basket. I'm a basket hanger. <laughs> I'm under the basket. Don't ask me to go up the other end of the floor. That's too far for me. <laughs> I was an old guy. <laughs> and so this young crop of Harvard Law School students, first year students are there early and they're all playing basketball all day long. And there's this one skinny dude that's elbowing me all the time. <laughs> Every day, two or three days. He must have elbowed me 500 times. <laughs> and I would go home sore each day. You're supposed to get better each day. I was sore each day. And then the fourth day I was determined I was going to elbow him. <laughs> or at least tell him. <laughs> Don't touch me again. <laughs> well, before I got a chance to talk, he hit me in the nose and broke my nose and my jawbone. <laughs> and I was a mess. And I got up and I'm trying to hold my face together. And I said, you son of a bitch, you know, you ever touch me again and I'll kill you. Honest to God, you'll be dead right here on the floor. He said, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. <laughs> he said, I, I get carried away and I just, you know, I'm not used to being around an old guy on the basketball floor. <laughs> I said, well, you know, don't don't touch me again. Don't make that mistake again, because it will be a mistake. <laughs> so the next day after I had my surgery to fix my face, <laughs> I show up for the first day of classes. And my ex-wife had just had a baby. <laughs> Little Nicholas, he's 24 now, but he was just an infant, three or four days old. <laughs> I had to take him to school with me my whole last year, because we didn't have any babysitters. <laughs> and I took him on my chest to class. Every day. First day, I'm sitting in the front row like this. I'm sitting there. 
that seat's empty, the rest is full, <laughs> and class is ready to start, and I'm saving that seat for my son in case I need it. And all of a sudden, in walks this guy. Guess who it is? The black dude who sits right there. <laughs> and I said to him, well, you're going to start with the elbows again today? I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> he said, who's that? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, who's that? <laughs> Pointing to my son. I said, that's my son. Your son? <laughs> You're at law school at your age with a baby? <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, you don't see many men around here with a baby. <laughs> Never saw one. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'm here. <laughs> and I have to have them with me because I don't have any place else to put them, and I want them with me anyway. So, you know, he started to talk to my son and shake my son's hand and tickle him and <laughs> entertain himself with my son every day for the whole year. <laughs> His name was Barack Obama. <laughs> And um, he loved my son. He absolutely loved my son. And I'd be out on the campus, and he'd see me from afar, and he'd come running over. Hi, Nicholas. I'd say, hey, I'm back here, too. He'd say, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to the kid. The kid's beautiful. How do you get, how do you get such a beautiful kid with an ugly old man? I'd say, it wasn't hard. It was a lot of fun, actually. So anyway, time goes on. I graduate from Harvard. I'm in line to go up and get my diploma. It takes like two hours. <laughs> and Barack Obama is a marshal at the graduation. He's one of the students hired to police the graduation. And he's standing with three marshals. And the two other ones are yelling at me, hey, you can't take the baby up there. <laughs> and Barack Obama said, don't try and stop him. You won't ever separate him from that kid. <laughs> and I went up. When you get up there, they take your picture when you get your diploma. So you have a permanent record that you actually did graduate from Harvard Law School and the dean hands you your diploma and they snap the picture at that second. So I get up there with my son and the dean handed the diploma to my son. And ever since then I've been trying to convince my son that he did not graduate from Harvard Law School that day, <laughs> that it was me. <laughs> but anyway, fast forward 14 years. That little boy is now 14 years old, elected a junior delegate to the Democratic Convention in Boston in 2004, where Obama made his big splash, first splash. And I'm not paying attention because I'm working. And my son comes home at the end of the second night at the convention. He says, Dad, I shook hands with the next president of the United States. I said, who, John Kerry? He said, no, no, Barack Obama. <laughs> I said, well, that's really interesting, Nicholas, because you used to shake his hand every day in law school. He said, well, that's not true. You never told me about that. I said, when did you ever mention his name before? <laughs> I never heard him discussed in the house. Did you ever tell me about him before? Did you know about him before? He said, no. I said, well, I didn't know that he was running for Senate either. <laughs> so anyway, he didn't believe me. Fast forward a few years, he graduates from Brandeis. He goes off to London to King's College to get his master's in music. And then he applies to Cambridge University to do his PhD in conducting, gets accepted, and they tell him he has to wait a year. So he calls me up and he said, Dad, you know, I have to wait a whole year. And if I go to work, I'm going to be stuck paying loans now. So what do you think? I said, well, you know, apply for an internship. And, you know, apply for the governor or uh, Congress or Senate or whatever and see if you can get a student internship. He calls me back a few hours later and he says, Dad, the president has six internships and the first lady has one. <laughs> I said, apply for the first lady. He said, why? I said, because I know her better <laughs> and there'll be less competition. So I called her up the next morning and I said, Michelle, I need you to at least look at my son's application. And um, I, you don't even know him because he was born after you graduated, but uh, I'd like you to look at his application and see what you think. And uh, she said, I can't promise you anything. Of course, you realize we're under a lot of pressure from different Congress and Senate about who we appoint as, as uh, interns. They want their daughters and sons and grandsons and so forth to be the interns. I said, I understand all that, but you know, if you just look at his paperwork, and see what he's, see what he, how he stacks up against the others. I'd appreciate it. And she said, I certainly will do that. About three weeks later, after there were 6,000 applicants for that job and 100,000 for the president, he got the job as Michelle's social secretary. And he went to work in the White House. <laughs> 
And as to hear him talk about it, it's the greatest thing you could ever have happen to you in your life, to be able to be in the White House for a year. And most people, when they go to work for the president, they don't work in the White, in the White House. They work in a building across the street. There's only 100 out of 3,100 employees of the president. There's only 100 who work in the White House. The rest work in a building across the street. And only one intern works in the White House, Michelle's. <laughs> so my son got to be in the White House for a whole year. And that was wonderful, wonderful times. He got to decorate the place for Christmas and all kinds of great things. And then when his year was over, on the last day, after you've given 16 hours a day, seven days a week to your country because you don't get paid, you get to have a meet and greet with the president. You do not get to talk to him otherwise because he's so busy, he's not available for people to talk to. In fact, if you talk to him, you get fired because that's the policy of the White House. Leave him alone. Don't interfere with his schedule. If he talks to you, you can talk to him, but you can't talk to him on your own. Same for Michelle, but of course my son was working for Michelle, so it was different. And um, so on this last day, he goes to the Oval Office, and he calls me up afterwards, and he said, oh, Dad, you wouldn't believe it. It's out of body experience. I mean, the President of the United States got up and came around the desk in the Oval Office and hugged me and said, oh, my God, Nicholas, I remember you when you were a little ball with a black mop. <laughs> and your dad used to bring you to school every day. If you saw your dad, you saw you, because you were with him all the time. And how lucky you were to be able to go to Harvard Law School the first year of your life. <laughs> and I think it did something to him. He became an extraordinary student. But uh, So that was how he finished in the White House. And then they, um, while he was there, there was an opening in the Library of Congress for a job that's... Um, Reduced to, you are the music director of the United States of America. <laughs> He's the music director at the Library of Congress for all the concerts in Washington, for all the appearances around the world. And you had to be able to play the piano, the French horn, sing, and conduct in order to get that job. And he did all four of those by the time he was 16. He was at Carnegie Hall for those four things, one at a time. And so he was very, very talented. And now he travels all around the world. He's in the Boston Symphony. He's in the London Philharmonic. And wherever there is a call for American music at some function or whatever, they send him to sing or to conduct or whatever. He conducts in Central America in South America, goes everywhere. <laughs> I guess he doesn't have to go back to college <laughs> because he's got it now. And he's got it because he had this great fortune to work in the White House. And I had the great fortune to meet that man and that woman when I was in the White House. And I did not get my son a job. My son got the job himself because of his talent. I simply asked them to look at him. And I'm so proud of the fact that what I've done has translated into a different life for my children. And when I was writing this book, this book is about a walk across the country. And while I'm walking, I tell you the story of going to Harvard. And I tell you a lot of family stories. It's basically my stories. And when I got to the end of the walk, I walked to 5,000 miles to the Hearst Castle in, in uh, California. And when I got there, I wanted to finish in the ocean, so I walked four miles farther till there was an opening to go out to the ocean. And I walked into the ocean up to my knees and sat down, and I stayed there for about two or three hours, thinking, <laughs> just thinking, listening to the sea seagulls and listening to foghorns and watching the whales way out in the ocean and thinking, I did this. Can you believe that I did this? I finished the morphine dream. And while I was sitting there, I was thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to do next. I had no clue. And that started to depress me. <laughs> I started to cry. I don't even know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> What that led to eventually was I came back to Massachusetts and I started teaching a course in college to seniors. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? But when I was sitting there in the ocean, I realized that you have to keep dreaming. Life is about dreaming. And if you dream and you plan and you execute, you get. 
So we should all be dreaming and planning and executing. Dreaming by itself, blah, 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 blah. Dream with a plan and execute the plan, then you're all set. And, you know, what that leads to is bucket lists, and we should all have bucket lists, all these things we want to do before we die. <laughs> well, you should write the bucket list today, not tomorrow. <laughs> the greatest labor-saving device of today is tomorrow, right? <laughs> Don't wait till tomorrow. Write it today. <laughs> and when you wake up tomorrow, start doing it. Start realizing your dreams, because that's all you got. You don't have anything else. All you have is your dreams. And yesterday doesn't count anymore. And tomorrow is kind of a mystery. <laughs> it's going to be what you make it. And if you make it to be those things that are important to you that you want to do before you die, that's what you got to do. Because you don't want to be one of those people who's laying on your deathbed saying, I wish I did it. <laughs> You'd rather be one that lays there and says, I did it. I remember at Harvard I had a classmate who was 86 years old. He was a doctor in his other life. <laughs> and when orientation was happening, I see this old guy around and I'm trying to figure out who he is. So I got over to him and I said, who are you? <laughs> he said, I'm a student. I said, you? I'm supposed to be the old guy here, not you. <laughs> he said, well, you know, I wanted to go to law school all my life, so here I am. I said, what did you do before? He said, I was a doctor. I said, well, <laughs> why didn't you do lawyer before? He said, well, my parents were doctors, and they wanted me to be a doctor. I didn't want to disappoint them. I said, well, what would you have done if your parents were morons? He said, I'd be a Yankees fan. <laughs> 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 but he graduated with me. He was 89 years old, and he practiced law for six years. And when he was dying in a hospice, he called me and said, come over and visit. <laughs> so I went over and visited. He had a grin that was twice as big as his bed. And I said, what are you so happy about? He said, I did it all. <laughs> I did everything in the world that I wanted to do. What the hell do I care if I die? About three days later, he died. And he was so happy that he did it in his life. And I'm kind of the same way. <laughs> but I wonder about lots of people who don't get it that your dreams is what life is about. If you dream and you plan and you execute, you'll have a wonderful time. And you'll be smiling when you go to your grave. My kids were giving me a hard time last year about the end of the world was coming, you know, and are you prepared? I said, prepared? <laughs> I got a smile on my face. What the hell do I care? I care about you. You don't get to have a life. <laughs> I had one. <laughs> and if I die tomorrow, gee, que sera, sera, who cares? I had a lot of fun. <laughs> and that's the way it should be for everybody. <laughs> and too many of us are caught up in everyday nonsense to appreciate the opportunity we have to dream and to make our dreams come true. In the course I used to teach called, What Am I Going to Do With the Rest of My Life? <laughs> I used to tell the students at the beginning of the semester, I know what you're going to do, <laughs> so I want you to figure out what you're going to do. And they'd say, well, what are we going to do? I'd say, you have to wait till the end of the semester. <laughs> I'll tell you at the end of the semester. And I know what you're all going to do, too. <laughs> Simple as that. I do know. I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. I know, I know what everybody's going to do. And people are always like, how would you know? It's real simple. You're going to do whatever you decide to do. That's it. That's what you're going to do. Whatever you decide to do. So what are you going to decide? That's it. Thank you.